monthly computational modeling, post-disaster rapid response, and a coordination office, of course. Uh, and we're just talking about the one that's sort of uh, outlined in orange or light color there. Uh, the University of Texas Have Mobile Shakers Will Travel is our logo. Okay, this is just to give you a sense for the NSF engineering civil infrastructure that you can contact. Uh, Giovanna Biscontine is in the main office for, for civil engineering and she would be the main one. And the other one that I know is Joy Pauschke, and she's over these folks. Uh, and you're able to contact any one of them, and they are very helpful, I can tell you. Now, down at the bottom, very importantly, you'll see here NERI equipment, and that means all NERI equipment, uh, not just ours, can be used with funding from any NSF program. So it doesn't matter, this was civil. But it, but it can be other programs, and that's what we're trying to encourage. That's what NSF is trying to encourage right now. And the NERI equipment can also be used, <laughs> probably should be double underlined, at higher rates uh, for non-NSF funding, including industry. At that point, uh, it gets a little more complex, and you would contact whatever equipment site you were interested in, and so you'd contact us, me, Brady, fan you, someone like that to uh, use it for non-NSF funding, uh, but it's definitely much higher rates. Next. Okay, this just shows you the NERI at U Texas team. Um, I'm the PI, uh, I'm the old guy. <laughs> uh, Brady Cox is a co-PI, even though he's a professor at Utah State now, he has an appointment at Texas and he still is with us in uh, this area and we're very thankful for that and very happy for that. Uh, a co-PI is associate professor, sorry about that, Patricia Clayton does a lot of the outreach activities. Uh, another co-PI is Bob Gilbert, he also is the chair of our department and he has used us on several of his NSF projects, I think on two. Uh, we have cyber security, electronics, and so forth. Robert Kent, operations manager, is Dr. Fan Yu Meng, who was uh, started us out here. And then these are our technicians that go in the field. Uh, Cecil Hoff Power has been around these machines ever since he probably was 25, it seems. He can walk up to them and tell them if, tell if they're working properly. The person now that runs some equipment in the field is outstanding, uh, just as Cecil is, but Andrew Valentine is a, a really skilled person with the machinery and extremely helpful. So those are the people, we would be the folks that would be helping you if you came through UT. Next. Okay, this is just an overview now of our equipment. So near at, at U Texas equipment overview, we have five large servo hydraulic mobile shakers. That means they can, and the wheels are so big you can tell, they can propel themselves off-road, not on-road uh, for most of them, but off-road. Um, T-Rex is a triaxial shaker. I'm going in the upper left-hand corner. T-Rex is a, good, thank you. T-Rex is an off-road mobile shaker that is that can shake in the X, Y, and Z direction. That's the only one in the world that we know that's operational, at least. Uh, going across a horizontal line there, liquidator is low frequency. It's mainly vertical. It can can be used in two modes, but but we've we've only used it in vertical. But the key here is it's the only one in the world because we had especially built, and it goes to very low frequencies. Uh, you'll see that in a moment. Uh, then we have Thumper, an urban shaker, which is a 3D shaker. It's at the, the uh, shaking mechanism at the, at the very end of that, uh, that truck, and, uh, and, and it is the smallest one we have. We, during our, our life, we've gotten two more shakers uh, from when NSF started us. You see Raptor, a mid-sized shaker, which is vertical, but it can propel itself down the road. Then next to it is Rattler, a horizontal shaker. 
Uh, and we can synchronize these shakers together at times when need be. You see also a big rig, 20, 26 wheeler, that uh, allows us to move things around. So if you're in an area, let's say we just were Idaho National Laboratory and you might have to move five miles this way, eight miles that way. You may need the big rig, you may not there, but it allows you to move around and you don't have to hire a truck. Okay, uh, field supply truck and maintenance and fuel. Uh, we have an instrumentation van. Uh, uh, also, it's, it, it also functions as a cargo van. You see it pulling a trailer there and there's air condition. And then Brady will talk to you about some of the hydraulic, some of the capabilities of these uh, pushing instrumentation in the ground and so forth in just a minute or two. Next. Here's T-Rex, and on the right-hand side, you see force versus frequency. So I'm not going to explain all the numbers. It's, that will be sort of a waste, but it's very forceful, let's say. And, and you see the, the horizontal force is basically about half of the vertical because of the coefficient of friction, but that can go in the X, Y, or Z directions. Uh, extremely important. Uh, a piece of equipment. Again, one in the world. Okay, so this is Brady's, but th this is a, go ahead, can you start it, Fanu? This just shows T-Rex shaking horizontally now, and we're shaking to, uh, yeah, and it's back and forth, in and out. We're shaking to try to liquefy the soil that we have instrumentation in, you can't see it very well, but on the other side is also Rattler, which is synchronized and shaking with it. And let me just tell you, you're going to see some of uh, 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 the instrumentation trailer uh, in a little bit. And the things were jumping all around. We had to put hands on, on uh, very expensive equipment so it didn't fall off our, uh, our data acquisition equipment, so it didn't fall off the shelves. We were flying every which way. Next. Okay, here's Liquidator. Uh, Liquidator, again, is really meant to be a very low frequency shaker for vertical uh, shaking, really. And that is to, we use it a lot to create Rayleigh type waves. And in fact, you can see Liquidator goes down to 1.3 hertz, yep, right where FanU is pointing. Uh, in the vertical mode, sorry, in the horizontal, in the vertical mode, yep. But in a special mode is what I was trying to get to. It will go down to 0 0.7 hertz, and you'll see that in a minute. And yes, we've got it in the, in the horizontal mode, but uh, we haven't used it. Where you see it right there is on top of Yucca Mountain. Okay, that's okay. And here you go, it's shaking in the vertical mode, and so, yep, you see the, the weight, that's moving up and down, and there's a base plate on the ground there, um, and it, it's a very fine piece of equipment. Uh, we, it, we don't have time for me to explain more. Okay, here is a special operational mode, and uh, that, okay, that's me um, praying over there because we don't want it to tip over, but that allowed us to generate my, a mile-long wave in Georgia, for instance. Um, that uh, mile-long wave with surface waves will allow you to see a half a mile into the ground without boreholes. Uh, it's, and and uh, with some of the work that Brady does in the micro tremor array measurements, uh, they really fit together beautifully. Next. Okay, so here's Raptor, a standard vibrosize, and we might use that on a smaller project where we're driving around a bit. That was in Canada not too long ago. Um, on a project with UCLA that uh, was partially funded through the National Science Foundation. Next. Uh, here's Rattler. That's where I said that was, that was synchronized with T-Rex. And you just see the, there's lower uh, loads, but at times we synchronize these. At other times, 
we synchronize them, but you might have one shaking, 10 times the shaking of the other and so forth. So there's a lot of things you can do when you can start using multiple shakers next and things you can study. Thumper is our urban shaker. That's, we can drive it in the city and people don't come out of the buildings ready to sue us uh, or they aren't interested in us <laughs> for a bit at least. And you can see, yep, very good. You can see the low force levels, but it's very been, it's been very helpful in many different types of experiments that we've worked on. Next, but particularly by the way, body waves and spectral analysis of body waves. That might not mean much, but, but it's very beneficial there. Here we are, we're moving T-Rex, and it could be liquidator or rattler, but we're moving them on the big rig that just shows you. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, I guess I got to let next, please. <laughs> Never mind. So, okay, so here, here are support vehicles. So we have, you know, the field maintenance and fuel truck because we probably go through when we have the one of the machines out in the field like t-rex or liquidator in two days you're going to have to refill the two fuel tanks so that truck will also do that you see the trailer and you see it's air conditioned uh and that's extremely beneficial yep uh, particular in texas and so forth in the summer the instrumentation van you could also call it a cargo van uh, but we also take that in the field, and then there's that trailer that's a smaller trailer. I think we're going to see a young man in the in the trailer number one with the air conditioning in just a moment. Next. Oh, -ho. so here just shows you inside that, that uh, instrumentation trailer, and we were in that trailer when the two things were shaking uh, horizontally, T-Rex and Rattler. We were looking out that window behind the, each one of those guys. Uh, and you see we have 168 channels of data acquisition, gets up to 200 kilohertz sampling and so forth. But the guy above is about to take over because that's a young Professor Cox as a graduate student. Is that correct, Professor Cox? Yeah, this picture is probably 20 years old. <laughs> we maybe shouldn't shouldn't say uh, that, but oh, you can tell I that it. I have a lot more gray hair now. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our data acquisition systems and sensors, and I'll leave my video uh, feed on until I, I play some uh, movie clips here in a minute. Um, but as Professor Stokey mentioned, we do have a pretty wide array of data acquisition systems. Um, we have numerous full spectrum analyzers that can be synchronized together to give us up to 108, 168 channels of DAC. And that's real time frequency domain capability. So we can measure in the time domain, we can measure in the frequency domain, uh, we can sample in some cases up to 200 kilohertz. Uh, these channels are not multiplex, so we can, we can measure all channels. Uh, in a particular uh, group, at least, that sample that fast up to that rate, uh, which is helpful sometimes when we're measuring, for example, P-wave velocities uh, traveling through saturated soil that propagated over 1,500 meters per second, or uh, P-wave velocities in rock, for example. Um, Sorry, the slide wasn't advancing. One really cool thing that we're super excited about, and we just got this news in the past week or two really, is that in 2021, we're going to be able to acquire a DAS interrogator. So for those of you who know about distributed acoustic sensing or fiber optic sensing, we'll now have DAS capabilities. And we're really excited about this. We think this is going to open up a whole new frontier of research possibilities, especially for many who are interested in uh, uh, geotechnical or geophysical site characterization. Um, there's other opportunities for monitoring structures and sensing strains uh, along dams or levees or uh, you know, even buildings and bridges. Um, so this, uh, interrogator that we're looking at is capable of measuring according to advertisement any fiber from any vendor single mold multi-mold enhanced backscatter 
with sampling rates up to 100 kilohertz and different gauge lengths as well. And so this is something that we're super excited that it will be part of our uh, equipment that you can apply for and use our sources in conjunction with fiber optic sensing. We also have a bunch of traditional ground motion vibration sensors like geophones. Uh, we have 109 one hertz geophones for low frequency uh, vibrations and those are shown here on the ground. This picture happens to be in New Zealand. Uh, we ship T-Rex all the way down to New Zealand. That's a story for another day, but it was down there for about a year doing various research projects. Uh, we also have 196 four and a half hertz geophones and we have uh, various refraction cables to support those. We have some geodes, uh, seismographs, 24 channel seismographs. Sometimes other researchers will bring their own. For example, Dr. Tran, who we'll talk later, has worked with us and we've synchronized his geodes with our geodes so we can do that type of work as well. Another cool thing that we've got coming up new in 2021, also new equipment, is we're going to add about 100 uh, smart solo three component nodal stations to our sensing capabilities. So these are GPS synchronized individual stations. Um, they, they're actually five hertz geophones, the guts of them, uh, but they have 24 bit digitizers and they're, you can see the size down here and the weight. And we can put those out, for example, in grids or in uh, arrays of various sorts for uh, passive micro tremor measurements, for active uh, full waveform inversion studies, for example. So there's numerous applications for these three component uh, nodal geophones. And we have 20 broadband uh, seismometers that you can use if needed. Um, we have 10 120 second period three component stations and we have 10 20 second period three component stations. And these are great. We've used these for topographic amplification studies. We use these for micro tremor array measurements, H over V measurements. Uh, this happens, I think I mentioned, maybe I can't remember. This is a topographic amplification study uh, where we are monitoring both active and passive waves. And so these are really nice sensors. These are, you know, pretty expensive. Uh, a lot more expensive than three component geophones. The nodal stations that you saw previously were about a thousand dollars for the three components and these are closer to fifteen thousand dollars let's say something like that. We have a pretty wide array of uh, instrumentation that we push into the ground. Two of the trucks T-Rex and Liquid Air have hydraulic rams on the back of the truck. So we can push standard CPT, and we have a number of cone penetrometers. We have seismic CPT, standard uh, CPT. Um, then we often build our own push-in sensors. These happen to be something we call liquefaction sensors. These ones in particular had three component MEMS accelerometers and a miniature pore water pressure transducer in them. But we're always pushing stuff into the ground that has some sort of vibration transducer and often some sort of poor water pressure transducer as well. And then of course, if you have an NSF funded project, you can always use the instrumentation resources from IRIS Pascal. And if you're not aware of IRIS, they have a huge pool of instrumentation for both geotechnical, geophysical, even some sensors that could be used for structural applications, some accelerometers. And there's a list of their equipment on the IRIS Pascal website. And if you have an NSF funded project, the PI only needs to pay for shipping these sensors and for travel expenses. If you haven't used their equipment before, they might want you to go out to New Mexico and receive a little bit of training on how to use the equipment. And sometimes they'll send a technician if needed out into the field to support your, your research project as well. So. Uh, I've used the Iris Pascal instrumentation several times and it's, it's very helpful and very, they're very professional group as well. Um, at our site, as part of our site, I should say, we also have a field testing site. Um, so you can see here's a map of the University of Texas in Austin. 
we keep our equipment up here in a, a garage at our research campus. And then down here to the southeast of Austin, there's a, a place that we call the Hornsby Bend test site. And the Hornsby Bend test site is really several different testing locations that we've used over the years for various purposes. So it's much cheaper if you use our equipment while it's in Austin, because you don't have to pay for mobilization costs, which end up being a huge part of the budget for most projects. So if there's something that you can do in Austin, for example, I'll, I'll show you several examples in a minute, but if you could do something at this test site, we can save you a lot of money on your research project. And in the past, we've used this site for full waveform inversion studies. Uh, Professor Kalavokas, who's one of our colleagues at the University of Texas, has used this site and has uh, published some papers about uh, uh, 3D full waveform inversion at the Hornsby Bend test site. We've also used this site for some invasive testing where we installed these metamaterial periodic barriers. Uh, that's part of a current uh, project um, where we're kind of looking, uh, the PI is looking, Professor Mo, at um, uh, looking at if we can design these periodic barriers to isolate structures, for example, um, from vibrations. So we have invasive site characterization data. We have a bunch of CPT tests out here where we know the site layering. We can do additional CPT work. We can do uh, you know, various sensing. And so if you want to use the Hornsby Bend test site, make sure you contact us as well. So real quick, I just want to, I'm actually going to turn off my video for just a minute and start playing these uh, videos. And as part of our, the science plan for NERI at U Texas, um, our goal is to work on improving subsurface imaging and contributing to nonlinear in situ testing, where you know in the past we've traditionally done small strain testing in situ, and then we've collected samples, let's say, and taken them to the, the lab to do large strain nonlinear testing. Well, we, we've now, in the recent years, been working on doing nonlinear testing in situ with our big shaker trucks by pushing instrumentation into the ground. Um, we also are trying to make contributions with our site and our equipment to structural health monitoring and soil structure interaction. Um, a couple years ago, we took one of our trucks and tested a T-Rex, actually, a big truck, and tested a bridge in New Jersey. Um, with Professor Guginski and Professor Moon from Rutgers University. So we've done structural health monitoring, monitoring soil structure interaction studies, uh, nonlinear in situ testing, subsurface imaging, and we're hoping that many of you out there will come up with other new and innovative ideas of how to use these trucks. And that's why we've asked our two guest speakers to speak a little bit about some of the research that, uh, that they've done. So. With that, uh, as Professor Stokey mentioned at the beginning, our slogan is, have shaker trucks will travel. And every one of these dots represents a place where we've done testing across the United States and in, even internationally in some cases. So when our site used to be part of the NICE network, um, we had 55 projects over at 11, 10 to 11 year span. And over the past five years as part of NERI, we've had 26 projects. Um, you can see where things are all over the place. So um, anyways, if you have a dream to go somewhere and do some cool research and you need mobile shakers and sensing capabilities, let us know. Real quick, I just wanna talk about how much it costs to use our equipment. I've only got about one or two minutes left, so I'm gonna be brief. But let me just say that if you come to Austin and work at the Hornsby Bend test site, this is for three, actually five days of only three hours a day, but let's say five days of shaking using T-Rex. To use T-Rex on an NSF project, project will cost you $27 an hour. That's incredible. This is a million dollar piece of equipment okay 
So for five days at three hours a day, the budget was $405. Okay, that's ridiculously cheap. You've got to pay for gas and fuel supply truck and stuff like that. But the budget for this whole project was $2,138 to use a unique piece of equipment like T-Rex for five days, three hours a day, and our smaller truck, Thumper, for three hours a day. So between those two, you're basically using an entire a work day worth of shaking, including setting out sensors and stuff like that, okay? By the way, at, these slides will be posted on our website, Design Safe, uh, and you can look at example budgets and, and rates for our shaker trucks. Now, this is a budget for a recent proposal that we're not gonna talk too much about, but this budget ended up being $114,000, so significantly more, but a huge, chunk of that was for mobilization to quote unquote an attractive island okay so shipping t-rex to this island was going to cost about forty four thousand dollars so you can tell when you start moving these trucks around it gets a little bit more expensive uh, and depending on the size of your project your budget will have to account for what you want to do if you want additional information contact either dr stokey myself dr clayton Dr. Mung, any of us are happy to talk to you about your proposal ideas. Uh, we're happy to help you and, and discuss anything that we can to get you using the equipment. I'm going to hold off on questions right now because I think we're going to save those to the very end. So keep your questions and if you want, you can even put them in the chat and we'll go back and read through them um, when we're kind of done talking. But for now, I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Tran, and he's going to share his screen and talk to you about his experience using our shaker trucks for a full waveform inversion study. Can you hear me too? I can hear you too, go ahead. So I suppose to turn off the camera, right? You don't have to. That, uh... All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Trans. I'm an associate professor from the University of Florida. So today I will discuss about the 3D full waveform inversion with the uh, Tumper source uh, wave fields. So the goal of this research is to characterize the uh, subsurface structure in 3D. So we want to characterize the soil rock profile. Um, and then we use the Tumper source on the surface to induce a seismic wave. And then we measure it by an array of the geophone on the ground surface. And then we do the 3D full waveform inversion to extract the subsurface uh, structure, or material poverty of soil and rock. So I will begin with the need of science investigations, and then we'll talk a little bit about the full waveform inversion motivation and challenges at your technical scale. A quick overview of the 3D full waveform inversion method uh, specifically for the hybrid uh, time frequency domain uh, with the help of the tumble source. And then we'll talk about the uh, data applications, a uh, few data applications, uh, and we'll finish with uh, some conclusions. So the unexpected site condition caused significant problem during and after construction of foundations. For example, if we fail to identify the buried void, and this void may cause a structure collapse, uh, that would lead to significant property damage or even fatalities. So shown here are two examples of sinkhole collapses in Florida. Um, these are a result of poor site characterizations. So if we uh, use traditional invasive tests like SPT or CBT, we actually test less than 0.1% of the material supporting the foundations and we could accidentally building the 
uh, building bridges on top of the void. So the seismic method can test over a large volume of materials because it's uh, faster and cheaper and it, uh, they can provide the soil rock property and stratigraphy and can also identify like embedded voids. So conventional seismic method use only the phase information of the measure wave field. So either first arrival signal dispersion curve or migration methods only use the phase information and basically ignore the magnitude of the waveform. So the resolution is limited. And the full waveform inversion is wave equation based and has potential to use entire measure data. So both phase and magnitude of the of the data and consider all the wave types, P wave, shear wave, Rayleigh wave, uh, and it has potential to characterize both P wave and shear wave uh, at high resolutions, for example, meter bit cells down to 20, 30 meter depth. Uh, so there are a few challenges with your technical scale, small scale down to 30, 40 meter depth. So if we use like, uh, uh, slash hammer source, uh, the wave citation is inconsistent and we don't know the source signature. And we often see the very strong variable near surface soil rock and that coupled with the uh, poor bright reinformation of the initial model would produce a lot of inversion artifacts or the local minimum. And the biggest challenge is the Rayleigh wave, the dominant Rayleigh wave in the small scale. So we have very little body wave with strong attenuations. So Rayleigh wave only propagate horizontally near the surface. So that will choose the line model update the shallow depths and the deeper structure is poorly resolved. So these are uh, challenges and if uh, they are not addressed, usually full waveform don't produce uh, the good result. Uh, we often see a lot of shallow inversion artifact within first five meters depth and then the deeper structure are not resolved. So just uh, in order to overcome this uh, challenge, this, we need the strong broadband consistent seismic source like mobile shaker. So now we can generate consistent waveform and we can measure the source signature and we also need the low frequency component so we can start the inversion with lower frequency. So we can begin with a basic initial model to avoid the local minimum. And we can also suppress uh, the inversion artifacts. So typically for the full waveform inversion, we want to determine the shear wave and P wave velocity profile. We conduct a seismic test on the surface to generate seismic wave we propagate through the medium and carry the material property of the subsurface structure. We measure it. Let's say the solid line here is a measure data from the field. So when we do the analysis, we're going to need 3D forward simulation. So we need to model the 3D wave to get the synthetic data. And then we match the synthetic data with the measure data. In this case, we use Gauss-Newton optimizations. And then we can extract the material poverty like shear wave and P wave velocity uh, in 3D cells. So this is an iterative process. So for, uh, with the tamper source, we can uh, do it in the combined uh, frequency. So for the forward simulation, we do it in time domain. So the benefit of the time domain is we can produce multiple frequencies simultaneously uh, without the requirement of the inverse matrix solver. So here, an example of wave propagation in 3D using 3D elastic wave equation. We also implement the perfectly matched layer at the boundaries. And then we do the um, inversion in frequency domain. Now we have the tamper source, so we can generate the uh, wave at individual frequency with the consistent magnitude. That would allow us to just use a few frequency to uh, do inversion instead of uh, store thousands of time steps uh, because the Gauss Newton require a lot of memories. So here we um, compute the velocity residual in frequency domain and then for the pair of source and receiver, we combine all of them 
to compute the misfit function, the least square error. And then we can update the material poverty M here, which is 20, 30,000 cells in, uh, uh, in the, this case. Uh, so a lot of unknown CS cell, VS and VP of cells. So we are talking about the problem around 50,000 unknowns. So we, we can update it iteratively here. Um, so J here is a Jacobian uh, matrix, which is the derivative wave field we compute it in frequency domain. So J times delta D here is the gradient, okay? Um, we can compute the gradient vector using the so-called uh, corset joy usually used in conventional full wave form inversion. But for the geotechnical scale, like I mentioned earlier, we have to suppress the inversion artifact at shallow depth. So this uh, inverse Hessian matrix is very important for the geotechnical scale. So this one acts like a weighting function having smaller weights at shallow depth, so we can suppress uh, shallow inversion artifacts and having more weights at the deeper depth, so we can resolve the deeper layers better. So it's very important for geotechnical uh, scales. So, so, but the J matrix is huge if we do it in the time domain. It could easily go up to 100 billion elements easily because the number of uh, elements equal to the number of unknowns times number of the source times the number of receivers times the number of time steps. So if we do a few thousand time steps, it's a huge matrix and require a lot of uh, compu computer RAM. So with the tumble source, we can do it in the frequency domain. So instead of storing thousands of time steps, we only need like three frequencies. So we can reduce uh, the required memory by 80, 90% uh, by using the tumble source. So here's the uh, uh, application to the uh, site. So the site was a uh, dry retention pond in Newberry, Florida, about 30 miles away from the UF campus. Um, so here the site consists of the five sand underlain by uh, weather limestone. So we did uh, uh, the data. Uh, we, the, the side was marked by 25 lines, divided it in every three meter spacing, and seismic data were collected by Mary at uh, your Texas team using 48 uh, five and a half hertz vertical zero phone and a tumble source. So we did, uh, uh, we collected the data at two different locations and one of them with the voice uh, presented here. So the test area here is only 12 by 36 meters on the ground surface. So 40 feet by 120 feet. So the blue circle here are geophone locations at uh, three meter spacing. And the source here is 65 at the red cross here, the source location. Uh, and then the tumble source was used to induce the data at individual frequencies from 8 to 80 hertz. So we have a broadband, uh, broadband uh, frequencies. And then for an analysis, we only use up to uh, uh, 30 hertz in this case. So the source signature is here. We filter it, take it out or the higher frequency more than uh, 30 hertz. So we use from around 10 hertz to 30 hertz to do analysis. So we uh, begin with a spectral analysis of surface wave to build the so-called that initial model. So we have a softer soil on the top at higher frequency and then increase the velocity with depth. So from 300 on the surface down to uh, increase to 600 down to 8, 10 hertz. Uh, we did two uh, inversion runs. Uh, in frequency domains. So the first run we started at uh, three frequencies simultaneously, uh, 12, 15, and 18 hertz. And then we continued the second run on the result of the first run. So the second run we did uh, 20, 25, 30 hertz. So we only do analysis for six different frequencies. Okay? And it took about 32 hours on a very good computer. So here's a comparison of the data in frequency domain. So it is the magnitude at 12 Hertz. So for instance, we have a 48 
cruciferous here, and we can see here that is the magnitude of the waveform at uh, uh, 10, uh, 12 hertz. So the source is in the middle of the domain, so we have uh, the wave magnitude uh, at 10 units uh, when the receiver uh, is located further from the source. So very consistent wave attenuation that allows us to do the, for the, the analysis in frequency domain. So we only did analysis at six different frequencies and it turned out we can match entire measure data at all from 10 to 30 hertz. That's mean a lot of redundant data and we don't need to do analysis for all the frequency. So we can select a few representative frequency and do analysis. And here's a comparison for a few channel function. We have a measure data in time domain. Uh, the red one is estimated data from the forward simulation and they agree very well. And here's the inverted result cell by cell. So we have a, a 0.75 uh, meter cell here. There were about 25,000 cells in this case. So the depth of the medium is down to 18 meter depth or 60 feet depth, cell by cell. So we can see here there are two layers here, the softer material on the top down to about six, seven meter depth, underlain by weather limestone variation in both directions. And we identify two anomalies, one in the middle, one on the right hand side. And then the P wave on the right hand side here is consistent with the shear wave image in terms of software material on the top underlain by where the limestone in this case. So here's a 3D rendering of the inverted result. So on the top here, we have uh, the shear wave image, right, cell by cell, again down to 18 meter depth. And then we can see here variable limestone at the bottom in 2D, right? So with variable limestone, uh, and then we have a two anomalies here, right? Low velocity zone having the shear wave velocity less than 100 meter per second. In this case, about 60 meter per second. Very soft material here. And then the P wave rendering is at the bottom, similar format with variable limestone at the bottom, two anomalies at the shallow depth, okay? And then we did the invasive test here. There exist two voids at these two locations. So SPT1 and SPT2, um, you can see here there's no material from four to seven meter depth in SPT1. SPT2, the void is quite small, smaller than what we image, maybe partially due to the uh, revel material inside the void. So we image it a little bit bigger than the actual uh, void we identify from the uh, SPT. Um, the top of bedrock here is around six to seven meter depth. All right, so that is the conclusion. Uh, the tumble salt produces very strong broadband consistent wave field required for the time frequency 3D for waveform inversion to produce a good result. Uh, both shear wave and P wave can be extracted at high resolution. For example, a meter p cell down to 18 meter up in this case. Uh, the seismic result agree with the invasive SPT results, including the depth of bedrock and the identification of buried voice. And this research is funded by NSF through two grants. And we would like to thank the NARI at uh, EU Texas team for conducting the seismic data for us. Uh, we also thank the FDOT for conducting the SPT tests and our research team at UF, including Dr. McVay, uh, Dr. Hilton and uh, myself, two PhD students, Chung Nguyen and uh, Marzit. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Trent. Uh, I guess that the uh, queue on share. Stop sharing. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Hey, Derek. Um, now we'll have the next speaker, Derek Lick from um, Feather River College. Uh, this is, he's going to present the project he worked on at Stanford University.
Go ahead, Derek. Sorry, one second. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be very brief as I see our time is starting to tick away from us um, and uh, uh, take us back in time, I guess, quite a few years now. This was a, a research project that I did when I was at Stanford University. Um, and it was part of a much larger crustal scale experiment. It was a wide, a wide angle refraction experiment that we had funded uh, through a number of different funding sources, including uh, NSF. Um, and uh, as the uh, project got close, uh, we uh, saw an opportunity to bring on T-Rex uh, specifically to try to collect some crustal scale and basin scale reflection uh, and refraction data. Um, so I'm just gonna really quickly give you a, kind of a, a quick overview of uh, the two different uh, elements of the experiment that, um, that are worth noting today. Um, so the first part was uh, a, a, a young, uh, active uh, sedimentary basin, so it's bound by a, a relatively high angle normal fault, active normal fault uh, in um, uh, uh, basin on the northwestern edge of the Basin and Range Province, kind of on the edge of northwestern Nevada, northeastern California. Um, as you can see from the upper left-hand corner here, uh, this was a uh, high angle, high offset normal fault, about uh, uh, at least two kilometers, maybe more of offset in the last five million years. There was uh, geothermal exploration and production in the area, mud volcanoes, very active, very active place. Um, the shader relief map, that's the inset, uh, bounded by red, gives you a kind of an idea about the scale of this experiment. So we're looking at a sedimentary basin that was about 15 kilometers wide. Um, and, uh, and what we did is we ran uh, T-Rex across the sedimentary basin uh, from east to west um, and put a source point every um, uh, 10 meters. Uh, and we were recording with a 40 meter spacing. Um, single component uh, Texan uh, recorders from Pascal. Uh, this was conducted, I gosh, I think in maybe 2004 now, so it's quite a few years ago. And uh, as we saw earlier, some of the recording technology has improved tremendously. Um, anyway, that's the setting for our experiment. Uh, this is a slightly zoomed in version on it. Um, and so you can see that uh, in, uh, in this, um, in this particular basin, so this basin uh, represents a small uh, portion of what was a 300 kilometer wide, wide angle refraction experiment. We uh, were particularly interested in the behavior of this basin and the geometry of the fault depth. And so we worked with uh, UT Austin and uh, uh, to collect what to us was a high resolution profile, at least for uh, crustal seismologists. Um, and we did this um, over a, a fairly short period of time. Uh, this is what the line looked like itself. It was paved in parts and dirt in others. Um, uh, there is the T-Rex on the ground. We saw a photo of that earlier. Uh, this is what it looks like when it lifts up its base plate. Uh, it has some pretty uh, strong teeth uh, for that triaxial motion. Um, and so one thing that we had to do in order to collect data quickly was uh, make this thing uh, viable for on pavement use. And so uh, as a very homespun experiment, we uh, attached a couple of thick sheets of plywood to the base of it with the straps that you see there, and instead of taking the teeth off and ran the T-Rex directly on the asphalt. And we had the roads department out as we started the experiment, uh, watching the sweeps uh, to make sure that it wasn't causing too much damage to the, the asphalt. And they were satisfied uh, that the roads weren't going to be destroyed. And so we marched along with the uh, with the experiment. Uh, we saw the fuel truck earlier. I don't know that, uh, I don't know that Austin had that when, uh, when we did this experiment. I wish they did uh, because we filled up that truck every day with uh, the gas cans that you see right there. And that's me in the back of that, uh, back of that truck loading every drop of fuel that was required for the course of that experiment. Um, the data itself was uh, very useful actually. Um, and certainly the highest resolution seismic data uh, that existed in that particular sedimentary basin at that point in time and probably still is as of today. Um, uh, so what you see at the top is obviously the expanded uh, 
processed but uh, uninterpreted seismic data section uh, for that basin. And then uh, you can see how it fits into the larger geologic cross section of the area. So you can see that there's um, basically a high angle East Dippy normal fault that's created that sedimentary basin. Um, as we uh, began to interpret the data, we could uh, pull out of the data a number of important structural elements from that, um, from that experiment uh, that we were able to tie to some of the geothermal exploration work in the area and a paleo seismic trench that, trench that had been uh, dug by the USGS uh, very close to the location of this particular seismic profile. Um, so that was our, uh, that was our uh, sedimentary basin profiling line. Um, and you can see that we were uh, getting um, uh, clear, coherent seismic data down to a couple of kilometers depths uh, with that sweep pattern that I described earlier, source point every uh, 10 meters. And I think we were using one minute sweeps uh, from about five to 40 hertz for that portion of the experiment. Uh, we also uh, tried to do uh, crustal scale uh, reflection and refraction profiling with the T-Rex in a central portion of the um, of the larger wide angle line. Um, and uh, in this case, we had a wider uh, receiver spacing, receiver spacing at about 300 meters um, with um, uh, source spacing on the order of uh, 300 meters as well. Um, what we were trying to do in this particular case was to see if the T-Rex, which obviously has quite a bit of muscle, uh, could produce crustal scale seismic data in the way that uh, uh, the CoCorp experiment that uh, some of you crustal geophysicists may be familiar with uh, from Nevada uh, from the 90s did, where they ran a multi-truck uh, uh, array, multi-vibe truck array across uh, the central portion of the uh, Basin Range province. Uh, what we found here uh, with the T-Rex as a single source was that we could certainly get uh, coherent data down to upper crustal and possibly mid crustal levels, um, but, uh, but not enough to produce uh, coherent reflections from where we expected the base of the, uh, the crust to be. Um, and so here you can see fairly coherent arrivals out to about 20, 20 plus kilometers, and maybe some incoherent energy out to 40 to 50 kilometers. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were able to use this to help constrain some of the structures in a central portion of our wide angle, larger wide angle experiment. Um, but we weren't able to produce the same quarter, same kind of reflection uh, characteristics from the base of the crust that the uh, multi-truck, I think it was a five truck experiment that was used in that CoCorp uh, array from the, from the 90s. And I know that I'm bumping right up against the hour, um, so I'm gonna, uh, switch out uh, and just uh, quickly finish with a couple of conclusions. Uh, it was certainly a, a great source for upper crustal imaging and velocity, velocity modeling. Um, lower crustal targets may be out of reach for T-Rex in single vibe work. And then um, the, S, the S wave capabilities are um, uh, certainly uh, really enticing for a wide range of experiments. And then just from a kind of a personal and practical perspective, I just want to say, and I wasn't paid to say this or anything like that, I get nothing for it, but uh, working with the UT Austin folks was um, just a really fabulous ex experience. Uh, we had a really large and complex experiment that they uh, willingly dove into the middle of. Uh, it was a logistical challenge for them to, uh, to get to where we were working, and uh, they worked with us from start to finish and were just really wonderful partners. It was a, uh, really, it was a highlight of my research experience.